It's one of those things I was thinking, should I catch up on that? But at the same time, I was just like, mm. I, I, I forgot how long it was. Is there going to be enough time to watch it? I mean, you could probably find a free version of The Sim Samurai, but if you try to buy it like on Amazon, it's like 35 bucks for the Criterion Collection version. It's like, okay, I'm not getting that anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I was better at planning, I probably would have maybe watched that and then seen all three of these movies, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, if it didn't cost so much, it would have done You probably could get it on Amazon for three bucks, though, to stream it or rent it or whatever. That would have been probably the way to go. Yeah, yeah. Because it'll probably be another 15 years till I watch it again, so. <laughs> well, I remember watching, I remember watching before and liking it, but it's not one of those movies you just pop on or whatever. You know what I no, mean? No, no, it's, it's a really amazing movie, but it's not like, yeah, as I say, yeah, it's not one of those it's, ones where you're just like, oh, man, I can't wait to watch that, like, over and over again. It's like a really long, it's like, cause that one's technically in like Magnificent Seven itself is kind of a, they're both kind of war films. Like the first Magnificent Seven and, uh, and, uh, Seven Samurai are both kind of war films. Cause a lot of it is just setting up and just kind of planning and like taking their time. But when the action happens, it really happens. Yeah. And I feel like, I almost want to say in Seven Samurai, the action takes actually a little bit longer to get to, where in Magnificent Seven, at least there's a couple action scenes in the beginning, and then there's kind of like, well, let's sit down and talk for a bit and see who's going to be on the team. Mm-hmm. Exactly, yeah. Well, I remember just like, because it's one of those things, it's, it's funny, because Magnificent Seven, people, uh, the, the original, 1961, people look at it now and say, oh, it's such a masterpiece. It's so beloved. It's an American classic. Back when it came out, though, a Americans lot of people... Americans hated it. Yeah, and a lot of people, like a lot of American film critics, time it's like it's not the same thing as a Kurosawa's movie. It's not the same thing. Fuck this movie. And over time, people grew to love it. But like, it's also one of those things. Like, you, you, all these people can say whatever the fuck they want back then. But when a Kurosawa says like, "I love that movie so much," here's a fucking sword. It's <laughs> yeah, like, you, oh, you fucking take that sword and you be yeah. very grateful. Yeah. It's- like I'm Kevin Smith said, I mean, you know, whether you know or not, Kevin Smith said, like, a lot of people shit on Red State. Quentin Tarantino told me he loved that movie. So I'll give a fuck what anybody else says. Yeah, exactly. So once that's the case, you're like, yeah, who cares anymore? Mm-hmm. But no, that, and the weird thing, too, is like Magnificent Seven. This is why I think it makes for a good alternative Western for the fact that, one, it's that's kind of a weird concept at the time is to say, hey, let's take this samurai flick. And turn to a Western. I mean, over time, that seems kind of normal. And, it, like, those genres almost kind of appear to be... They mirror each other as almost being very, very similar. But that was a brand new idea at the time. And, yeah, when they brought it to the U.S., people just either, for some... I don't know if maybe it was, like, there's probably two things. Like, one's, like... Because I can't imagine everybody going, like, Oh, my God, it was not nearly as good as Seven Samurai. Because who the fuck was watching Seven Samurai back in those days? Like, if you think people have a hard time with subtitles today, back then it was probably <laughs> even worse. People were like... Fucking jump down on the Japanese on the screen! And it's like, uh, <laughs> calm down. Well, when me grandpa at the time, he'd be like, calm down, dad. It's fucking, this movie's cool, man. It's fucking like, it's fucking sweet. You know, and this, I, like, I fought them overseas, goddammit. I ain't watching one of their movies. You can't trust them. And they pull out that sword and they'll chop your dick off right in front of you. <laughs> they did it to Billy. They did it to Billy. He's never the same. You ever wonder why he's a janitor and he always holds that mop in a very firm grip? He's missing something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say this one. Um, the uh, we'll, we'll go to all, we'll cover all of them. Like not not Seven Samurai that much because it's been so long since I've seen that movie. But um, Magnificent Seven, the nineteen sixties one. Mm-hmm. That one actually, because you know the the the, the new one, the two thousand sixteen one, kind of like fuses certain characters and changes certain characters around. Where I remember the the four characters that really stood out were. I don't know the actors' names. I have the internet right There's in front of me. There's Brenner, who is no, like, no, I'm talking about. I'm talking about the the magnificent. I'm talking about uh, Seven Samurai. Oh, the Seven Samurai. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know those actors' names, but I guess we could do our little hello, welcome to the Old Man Orange podcast. I'm Spencer Scott Holmes, and I'm Ryan Dunnigan, and we're doing a good old fashioned retrospect on everything Magnificent Seven. Well, not everything, because we're not going on the sequels, but this is all part of our alternative western series. Brenner, McQueen, Coburn. Vaughn, Bronson, Buckholtz, Dexter, The Magnificent Seven. We wish you to help us. There's this man, Calvera. 
A thief. A murderer. He and his men, they steal our food. And then they leave us to starve. And he will do so until he is stopped. Even five wouldn't give us too much trouble. There won't be any trouble if you ride on. Ride on? I'm going into the hills for the winter. Where am I going to get the food for my men? Buy it or grow it. Or maybe even work for it. Seven. Somehow I don't think you've solved my problem. We deal in lead, friend. Solving your problems isn't our line. <laughs> Yule Brenner. Anything wrong? Turn that rig around and get it down the hill. Steve McQueen. Window. Curtain moved. I'm not in a good position. Let him stick his neck out. James Coburn. Call it. Robert Vaughn, Charles Brunson, Horst Buckholtz, Brad Dexter, Seven Magnificent Men in One Magnificent Motion Picture, The Magnificent Seven. Eli Wallach as Calvera, the bandit. Guns, ammunition. You know how much money that cost? Huh? Huh? He had a town at his mercy. <laughs> and the magnificent seven at his throat. Seven, who fought like 700. The magnificent seven. <laughs> What we were talking about before power outages happened was the characters of Seven Samurai. And uh, in Seven Samurai, there's the one guy, like I said, he's kind of the wild card. And, like, you know, there's that whole, like, character, like, arc thing. There's a character that's essentially water, character that's earth, character that's um, fire. fire, and then the character that's that is... love. No, he's not Captain. Yeah. <laughs> heart. Yeah. Yeah, heart. I got a chicken or I, think... I got a little monkey. I think there's wind. I think wind was the other one. And that guy is obviously fire. I want to say his hair stood. I'm not, I don't, I don't think he had a mohawk, but I remember I, I, for whatever reason, my memory says he had a mohawk. He had like, he, he hair had like stood, super Saiyan hair pretty much. He had super Saiyan hair and he had the long sword. He'd do a lot of rolling. He kind of reminded me of Mugen from Samurai Champloo. He probably said Mugen probably took inspiration from that guy to some extent. And, um, that guy had this whole thing about like, Oh, I want to be, you know, I want to, want to prove myself and there's like the younger guy who was like the apprentice and he was just very he like had a little bit of a thing for the girl in the village mm -hmm. they kind of took those two characters and threw them together into the uh young mexican gunslinger in uh magnificent seven and the original one the original we'll, we'll just yeah. say when we, we'll we we'll just say the 60s magnificent seven to clarify yeah, yeah that'll make it easier to say it that way but mm -hmm. No, that's true there. And in each one, they kind of like sort of get the characters kind of differently fused and around and so on. Because I will say the one thing about and rewatching the Magnificent 760 one again was that there's about five characters that stand out a bunch. And then about the other like three or I guess two, they almost kind of like fuse together because there's the one guy that like from a distance you go, oh, there, yeah, there's Charles Bronson right there. And then when it gets close, it's like, oh, no, that's not him. And it's like, why? I think it's James. Co that's James Corburn. For whatever reason, I remember James I remember Charles Bronson being the knife thrower, but James Corburn's the knife yeah, thrower. Yeah, well, the movie. weird thing, too, is because they're almost wearing, like, the exact same colors as well, too. They both got, like, a blue shirt on. I know it's slightly a different tint, mm -hmm. but, from but like, from a distance, you kind of go, oh, and then it gets close, like, oh, no, no, that's not. Yeah, no, they, they really run together. It's kind of weird. And almost in this movie, I will say that James Corbin, like, his character sticks out because he's the knife thrower. You know, Charles Bronson sticks out just because it's Charles Bronson, and he's, like, beating children and telling them, like, how to live <laughs> their life, like... 
<laughs> you know, your, your parents are damn good parents. You know what? They're fighting. They are not fucking pussies. Get your ass over here. Just like starts beating this fucking kid. Like, there you go. I'll beat some. That'll learn you. <laughs> There's the whole like, well, there is that thing. Cause like, it's one of those things. There is just this funny dynamic between Charles Bronson and the kids. Just not the whole like, get over here, you. Not that. But, I mean, the children. aspect of it. The aspect that he's just like the most rough and tumble guy of the whole group. He is easily like the bar brawler, the guy who's just like, you know, he's probably at the bar the latest, comes home staggering in at like four o'clock in the morning. (laughs) But he is a good, but like the kids look up to him and he's always kind of like, ah, these kids, as long as I stay in line, you know, but it's one of those things where he just like, he's kind of like chill. He's like the one that kind of gets along with the kids Unless then until they do something like the first when they first start hanging around, like there's a part where he's has his gun out and I actually really like this moment. They're like preparing for an attack. Three little Mexican kids come running up to him. He says, what are you doing? Like, oh, we got you. Ah, oh, you got me. Oh, yeah, whatever. Fucking little kid, you know. And then they're like, well, we're the ones that are supposed to maintain your grave and like put, give, give you new flowers if you die. He says, so don't worry. We thought you'd like that. Like, oh, well, uh, thanks. You know, so I, I hope you. She's like, that's a real honor. Uh. Sorry if I disappoint you. Like, oh no, I think we'll like it just as much as you live, probably. <laughs> I just got like, uh, okay, well, you really put. Me... And he's not even mad. He's just kind of like, oh, kids, kids in death. Wishing... <laughs> no, yeah, it's totally true. And then you know what's another thing too? I noticed and rewatched because I haven't seen both this movie and Seven Samurai. I probably watched them twelve twelve years ago or ten years ago or so. It was probably the first time I watched them, and also probably the last time I watched these movies. So. You know, I look at Yul Brynner. You know what he really is? He is like the rock or the Vin Diesel of his time period. Because you look at him and go, well, what is he exactly? You can't really tell what ethnicity he is. He's not really white, but he must be like some form of Italian, maybe Portuguese. I'm not too sure. He's Russian. Is that what he is? He's Russian. He must be like Southern Russian, too. Because I was I was looking at that. I was kind of the same thing. I was kind of like, what the fuck is he? And while getting ready for this podcast, I went and looked him up. He's Russian. And... uh it just sounds like, I, I mean, I'm glad he does an awesome job, but I'm surprised he got that job in the 60s. That's not like, you know, like, I could see a bunch of Americans that are like, well, he's okay for a commie, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, maybe that's the whole point of, like, the Magnificent Seven is just to say, hey, it's okay. You know, he could be a starring role. That's okay. We got Steve McQueen there to, like... I couldn't really to- pinpoint his accent in the movie, though. It's kind of there a little bit, but... um. It's like when I know when knowing he was Russian, I can pinpoint it. But he has a very faint accent in this movie. Yeah, he does, and he, that's the thing that's throwing me off because I was thinking about that. I was like, "What the heck is he?" And he just he just has that look though. Like it reminds me of like yeah, he's almost kind of like a Vin Diesel of that time period. Mm-hmm. I never put two and two together. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think this one one of the reasons why. I mean, I should have probably done my research a little better. Not gonna lie, but. I think one of the reasons why people really like this movie, because it seems like an all-star cast of all these great actors, but when it gets down to it, this is this movie kind of came out before a lot of them were big. So now it's looking back almost like, oh, look, all these awesome guys are in this movie. How'd they do that back then? Like, oh, well, this is before they're all really big, so. Well, because, yeah, because really, like, at this time period, you think about, like, Yul Brenner, he's already kind of established. You know, he's been Mm -hmm. in a lot of big fucking movies at this point. He was, like, in The King and I and Anastasia and all these almost, like, drama, dance movies, like, big costumes, expensive shit. But Steve McQueen, he wasn't in a whole lot before Magnificent Seven. You know, this was kind of like him being, like, the young character, even though it's kind of weird because he always looks slightly old. I don't know what it is about Steve McQueen. No matter what, you can't really tell his age. He always just looks like he's in about, like, his early 40s, maybe late 30s. It's this weird... Yeah, he has kind of a Clint Eastwood face. I mean, now Clint Eastwood, even when Clint Eastwood was kind of young, he still looked old. Yeah, exactly. And that's how Steve McQueen is, too. You know, and then Charles Bronson, he actually does actually look a little bit younger in this one, because I'm used to like 70s Charles Bronson for so many things. So I look at him and, okay, he's a little bit younger, but he still wasn't in like a whole lot. I mean, I guess, okay, if you're watching a lot of movies at the time, these are still like sort of recognizable faces, Mm -hmm. but they haven't become like maybe a household name yet. Well, Bronson, it's one of those things you look at him like in like uh, the 60s or like Great Escape or anything like that. He looks like, you know, he does like, you know, he, he he looks like he probably does some sit-ups in the morning, jogs a little bit, you know, still likes his red meat, but still works out a lot. Where once you get to like, you know, um, Death Wish, he's like, ah, fuck it, I'm done with that. No more, you know. He's just, because that's fine though, because I, I think Death Wish is the movie where it's just like, 
your dad gets mad and buys a gun. So <laughs> yeah, and get, decides to like, try to kill fucking Jeff Goldblum, but never does find him. Because don't be wrong, I do love. Because even though well, this is gonna be off topic for a second, Death Sentence is a semi sort of sequel to Death Wish because it was gonna be a sequel. It was gonna be a sequel, but then a script that never got used. They just changed some names around. Kevin Bacon, there's something about Kevin Bacon. He just looks too pretty. I'm like, that's not your dad. Charles Bronson's your dad, you know? Well, by that point, though, Kevin Bacon becomes your dad. He is. I know he is. But I'm saying because, you know, he just doesn't have that dad, like, fig. He doesn't have that, like, dad it's like an uncle. feel to him. Yeah, yeah, like Uncle Bacon, yeah. you know? <laughs> uncle Bacon's going to get revenge for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where Charles Bronson comes across much more as, like, you know... Just had a bad day, you know, lost a couple bowling games. Now he's got his gun, you know, go track down Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, it was just like, it just was like a series of events that led up to it. At the time, none of those things would have seemed like it would have mattered. But the tipping point was like the rape and murder from Jeff Goldblum that put him over the edge. <laughs> you know, but before that, you, you could start seeing it. Yeah, the bad bowling games, you know. Ah, one of my car's tires went flat that morning. <laughs> <laughs> what if that's all it was it was just one day it was just like it was just down. not even like it was it wasn't even it wasn't even like you said it wasn't even just like oh my wife and my wife was like killed and my daughter was raped it's not even that that really gets them it's just the whole like that was just the that was just the cherry on top you know it was really the fucking flat tire that flat tower put me over the edge at six in the morning <laughs> Just set me in a bad mood for the game. Phil had the last donut at work. Fuck, Phil's got my list, yeah. Yeah, if there wasn't something a little bit more pressing than Phil's donut stealing, it would be at his house <laughs> fucking murdering his ass right now. Man, I never saw a Death any I never saw like Death Wish 3. Maybe that's what happens in that one. But anyway, um uh back to Magnificent Seven though and Charles Bronson. I think that in the 60s one, Bronson is probably one of the guys that stands out the most. The three that stand out the most to me, Yul Brynner, Steve McQueen, because he's fucking Steve McQueen, yeah. and Bronson. Weird, weirdly enough, here you know, it's like the hat that they give Steve McQueen in that movie is like they give him like the most dirtiest, sweaty looking, funky hat, which is kind of weird. You just look mm-hmm. at that the whole time. It's like, really? Is that that's what you had to use was that hat. It's like, okay. Like, no wonder he's playing it the whole time. He's like, look at it. Everybody's looking at this hat anyways. I can make them look at it even more and steal you Brenner's fucking screen time. <laughs> it was probably something like that. And even like, I think I like about Steve McQueen is he's not even really, there's not that much to his character. He's just like the ultimate wingman. He's just the ultimate, like not even like it. it I, I don't, I get this kind of the sense of, um, between Yul Brynner and Steve McQueen, I get this really um, Brad Pitt, George Clooney vibe. Oh, totally. You know, from like Ocean's Eleven. Like, it's one of those things like, yeah, they're uh, he's his second in command, but he can still talk shit to him. And he can still almost run the show himself if he wanted to. But he, he'd rather just sit back and just kind of chill and fiddle with this gross, disgusting looking hat. Which is kind of funny because it's like they're both kind of like fighting over screen time. And I like Yul Brynner had a line once. He's like, yo, Steve, fucking cut this shit out. Because here's the thing. I could take my hat off for the rest of this movie, and they're only going to be looking at me. Because <laughs> at well, that time, he's just, he's just shaved head bald, which is not normal for people to be walking around that time period. Was he? Uh, was there like tension between them on the set? Yeah. You know? Well, they were just doing the thing where like they would go. Well, it was more Steve McQueen was just trying to like do that actor thing where he realizes that hey, if I just do stuff, even when Yul Brenner's talking, if I just do stuff in the background like fiddle or mess around, it'll draw attention to myself. It's kind of like there's all mm-hmm. there's all those other kind of like actor things that like they can do to be kind of dicks. Like the thing is, say like you got a wide shot of like all four characters. If you once everything gets said and done, if you take two steps forward, then the camera's like, fuck, focus. OK, now and then you become the one who's in main focus and they do little dick moves like that sometimes. So I think Steve was doing a bunch of that shit it- to Yule. And then after a while, then all the other actors start doing it, too. So then the director's like, fuck, now they're all out of control. <laughs> Part of me kind of gets that. I mean, I can see how that could be irritating, but I mean, it makes them all stand out a little bit more because that's one of those things that, like, I never thought of it so much as a dick thing. I guess if you're trying to upstage well, them, sort it's of, a dick thing because um, what you're more, doing is this is you're pulling time away from the guy who you're supposed to be. Well, this is on. what people will do too. They'll ruin the wide shot take by doing stuff like that, and it'll give them more chances to have a close shot. 
there's all these like fucked up mm-hmm. things that like actors will do to try to get more screen time in a sense at the end of the day because then the editor will sit there and be like, well, fuck, I can't use this wide shot now because God damn it, everybody's out of focus except for this one character. Okay, we'll cut to a medium shot. We'll cut to a close shot. Mm-hmm. No, I get you. I get you. I guess that's why you see, that's one of those things though why some people are like, he's such a good actor. Because, you know, McQueen does do a good job of just being kind of like, laying back, he's like fiddling with something. Or there's even the part where, I'm not sure if this was actually made for him or if they just had to cut back to this shot. There's the part where they're talking to the old Mexican, like, wise man of the mm-hmm. village. And he's saying, he's saying something to the lines of like, he's saying something like, it was like, when I turned 83, I became indifferent to women. And he gets this look on his face, like he backs away. He's like, hmm? Okay. <laughs> not, not like grossed out, but like, 83? Fuck, how old are you? Yeah, you know? like, is this the reason why <laughs> but, you live on like, um, the outskirts of town? So now I'm wondering, because like, it was just one of those things. Like, you usually don't see that even kind of reaction in most movies, in like those like older movies like that. Usually it would be a bigger deal, or like, it'd be like a big, big, big one, one liner for that. Where that, it was just like a small reaction, like, hmm? Uh-huh. Oh, fuck. Okay. Fuck. No, don't really look 83. Oh, fuck. Do I look like that when I'm 83? Do I know in the well, future I'll that I don't make real... it to 83? <laughs> we should probably say, in case you don't know what Magnificent Seven or Seven Samurai is about, um, basically Seven Sam. Uh, well, I'll, we'll start off with Magnificent. The same, same thing, just different eras. Um, Seven Samurai. So, I mean, uh, Magnificent Seven. Basically, there's this uh, town. Uh, that's uh, in Mexico that's always getting attacked by bandits led by Eli Wallach, the ugly from Good, Bad, and the Ugly. And three of the villagers seek go out seeking uh, help for their village. They come across Yul Brenner and Steve McQueen. Like, look, we, uh, we're really desperate. We're hardworking people. Please defend our village. They, they see him do so this one act recruited... like this other town they're at. They just they stand up for what's right, and they like ride that wagon all the way to the top and go, no, this motherfucker's getting buried right here. What are you going to do about it? I like that part, yeah, and I, I bet that's one of those scenes where they're sitting in the carriage together, just talking. And he's just like loading up the shotgun, like she's like, "Yeah, I'll go with you." Shit, never rode shotgun on a hearse before. Yeah, exactly. Just seemed like got to fulfill that little life destiny there. Yeah. And then after that, they realize, oh, these these guys might be able to help us out, so they go and they recruit a team of seven people, and from there it becomes a long stage. Like you get like a little bit of people of just you know introductions of the characters, seeing how they work together. And then you get to the part where uh, they actually get to the village and it's basically them planning and then a couple of small little attacks from the bandits coming early, but mostly them planning out and training the uh, locals how to fight. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of interesting to you because when when watching the remake to the original, it's like, oh, they don't make them Mexicans anymore. But But I read on here like a bunch of like the facts back in the day is that. Even back then, the Mexicans were like, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't want to be looked like we need fucking help from a bunch of fucking white people showing up because we can't defend ourselves, you know. And they also have this thing, too. They're like, no, every Mexican has to be look like they're clean. They can't be wearing any dirty clothes or anything like that. So it's kind of a pain in the ass for, like, the wardrobe was like, fuck, all their uniforms are white. It's fucking dusty out. So every fucking day, we got to get them new fucking uniforms so that they can look, you know, pretty out there. Because it is kind of true. You do watch a lot of like westerns, and like they go to Mexico, and it's like everybody's all sweaty and dirty, and like, I mean, fucking a hundred degrees out. I mean, I guess what else do you expect? It's not like showers are abundant back then, <laughs> at all. <laughs> you know, you mm-hmm. gotta find a stream. So, yeah, but it is yeah. kind of funny that they have they did have all those problems back then, which probably is the reason why it's just like some other like Arizona town or New Mexico town in the remake version. Just like, okay, we'll just bypass that. We just want to have Mexicans. We'll, we'll have a Mexican character, but we're not going to have a Mexican town. Yeah, and they actually have a... Uh, well, I guess they try to make it because the uh, the younger guy... I'm not sure if he actually is Mexican, but the younger guy is a member of the team. He's meant to be Mexican. Is that guy... Yeah, Chico. well, then Charles Bronson's half Mexican, too. Charles Bronson's half Mexican, half Irish. They mention that in there somewhere. So yeah, it's half, like... they're Half Mexican, half Irish, middle of the road Indian. Kind of those... Those kind of like baby... They're kind of like those, like, you know baby steps they kind of took you know to kind of make it seem a little less but i think the movie because like the, the like in the the remake oh the, the other remake the 2016 magnificent seven it seems to be kind of like a town of white people but it's you know the the seven themselves who you're mainly there to see it are all like very or they're all they're all very That's like the diverse. thing i like the most so, about watching that because that that new one's so fucking good but i like how they make all seven characters stand out like any one of them could be your favorite character. Because as I said, the only kind of downfall of the old Magnificent Seven, there's about two of them that kind of like, 
it's not that they don't stand out a little bit, but like they kind of fade away. They they don't stand out as much as Yul Brynner and Charles Bronson and James Corbin, Steve McQueen, and even the the kid. Those guys all kind of stand out, and then the other two, like in a sense, the guy who plays pretty much Ethan Hawke's character in the old one, like he has like two scenes that make him stand out. But other than that, though, he's just sort of there. Yeah, that character in the original one, Robert Vaughn play, plays plays yeah. Lee, and that's, that's the right. guy who has post traumatic stress syndrome, and he's the guy. He doesn't really stand out. He just comes across as kind of the coward, and then he has his moment to shine at the end. And then you also have the other character. There's a guy who's just seeking fortune. He's kind of the sort of the comic relief. Like, okay, now you guys all got gold here, right? Don't lie. I know you got gold. There's that guy. And that's played by Dex, uh, by Brad Dexter. And the whole thing with that was when you get to the new one, they actually, some of the characters still aren't really, um, they're not like so focused or so deep, but they all stand out a little mm-hmm. more. And like, you know, there's like what, what the main the, like, you know, the main personality of, say, the Native American guy is he's Native American. He's a badass. But I'll say that uh, Ethan Hawke plays the veteran. Uh, and, he do, and he really and like he, makes that character come to life because and the other one, it's like you think about it, like in the 60s, PTSD was not even a word yet. Nobody even knew what that meant. They, you know, they refer to things like shell shock and things like that. But it's kind of like, ah, he's just shell shocked. He'll get over it. Give him a couple beers. He'll be fine. So at that time period, it's still kind of cool to see that in the old movie, but they only really have it for one quick scene, and it is kind of one of those ones like, ah, stop being a fucking pussy, you know? It's more like that old-fashioned way, which I liked in the new one. It's just kind of cool to see in a Western and to really expose, like, hey, these guys from the Civil War were more fucked up than anybody else, like another, you know, think about it. Civil War, you're, like, extremely more fucked up than, a, you know, war nowadays, because at least nowadays you got some all kinds of medical help. You got all kinds of, like, repairs. Like, in that day, it's like, oh, well, you got gangrene? Well, guess what? Get the butcher over here. He'll chop your fucking leg off. Well, you might survive, you might not. Uh, I don't know. The guy next to you didn't survive, so you can look at him and kind of guess your future. You know, there was all kinds of dark yeah. shit going on then that you just kind of had to go with or what. So you probably were also yeah, exactly. So you're well. seeing even more things where that you know you people just can't survive whatsoever. It's not like you're going to get a prosthetic limb. It's not like they're going to get you know all kinds of surgery and things like that. It's just they got a couple choices and that's about it. So I think that by making that Ethan Hawke character and really focusing in on that, I think that's a really cool aspect. And they had multiple scenes, not just like one main scene that had it. That uh, in the original one, oh, see the '60s Magnificent Seven. By this point, we're primarily yeah, we're not talking, talking about, about really Magnificent Seven. Right? Seven. We just kind of led in with that, and so we got original and new. Original Magnificent Seven. There is one scene because basically they get across that he's kind of he claims to be a badass, claims to be a sharpshooter, only if it pays well. We get the first action scene. He's kind of vacant. He's not really there. They don't know where he's at. And he's like, oh, I was around the corner taking care of some other guys. Then later, he has a nightmare, screaming, waking up. And some Mexican guys come in like, hey, it was just a bad dream. Just get over it. He's just like, oh, yeah, well, it's not a dream. It's all here. It's all, you know, that whole deal. And there's a couple of flies flying around. There's three of them. He stretches his arm out, catches one. He says, like, I only caught one. There's a time I catch three. Uh, you know, and like, yeah, well, you know. Yeah, nobody else really cares. They, like, they yeah, put it a little poetically. Them. The, 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 like, you know, he's trying to do a Daniel saw on the flies, but, um, they all, the, the others, like they say it a little bit more, um, poignantly than this, but surely it's like, yeah, well, uh, we got kids and family. So, uh, fuck you. We don't care. We're yeah, exactly. So they got to get to that point, but, and then that causes him to actually kind of at the last minute, right. When it really matters to kind of come back and do the right thing, which is what happens. In the yeah, exactly. Well. So yeah, they, they both do that too. But I do really like these characters get like they just dive in. Every character just stands out a bunch. I mean, you, you got Denzel as the Yul Brenner character. And of course, he's like, you know, taking scenes. And really, that movie almost opens up in the new one. It could almost be like Django, too, because he almost start, he almost starts off as does. like the Django character. He's the black bounty hunter guy running around town. Everybody like freaks out when he comes in and just starts shooting the place up. But then he's all legal and everything like that. It's just like, oh, OK, well, that's pretty much like Django. But that's not a problem at all. Man carries a gun, he tends to use it. Dan, you dead? Pity. I had just ordered a drink from that man. Took a job, looking for some men to join me. Is it difficult? Impossible. How many you got so far? 
You and me? <laughs> Who's she? We work for her. Good lord. That's right. That man murdered my husband. I want something. I take it. He will take everything we have. So you seek revenge? I seek righteousness. But I'll take revenge. I need more than a few to help us fight. What a bunch of misfits we are. You know how to shoot that thing? I'm good. So am I. He's local, my friend. Oh, we're good. We got a Mexican. I sense we are bonding. Oh. We got a seven. He's got an army. And they'll be murdered by the world's greatest lover. <laughs> Why are you here fighting someone else's fight? These people deserve their lives back. Just make sure we're fighting the battle in front of us, not the battle behind. Every man's got the right to choose where he dies. We have nowhere else to go, so. You ain't never seen a soldier like me. One, two, three, I'm a vigilante. Four, five, six, kiss that ass goodbye. When I pull the gun, then somebody gotta die. What's the plan? I've always wanted to blow something up. Is that a plan? Yeah. I'm gonna put your lights out. We can do this right now. I'm ready. How'd we do? I think we killed them all. Something I want to say real quick about uh, the new Magnificent Seven is I've heard a lot of people, Some of, part of me understands this critique, other part of me is like, yeah, well, you know, everything's subjective, but it's like, what the fuck do you want, you know? Um, something that a lot of people are complaining about is how the new one doesn't really try anything new. It's just kind of like basically sort of reinventing the wheel, just making a fun, safe, crowd-pleasing Western movie. I think, that's, I think that is me, totally I'm wrong there. I have to say that. You always seem to find the critics that are always like negative. Basically, a lot of people are saying that this thing is just kind of a crowd pleaser. And it's one of those things, well, a lot, a lot of movies this day and age have that whole thing where you, where they're going for the retro Western. Now everything is one of two things, it seems, if they do a Western. Well, one of three things. Something inspired by a Western, so something like Faster or Good, Bad, and the Weird. Or something like um, something like Django, where it's incredibly violent, which don't be wrong, I love that. Or something the a little artsier ones, yeah. and trying to be very, very bleak and very to the point, you know? So that right and like this is one of the few ones I think I've seen in a while where it's been like, yeah, this is a fun western. This is a fun western action adventure movie just like the first one was, and it's trying to pull from that. It's doing its own thing. It's showing it differently. But, I mean, because all the characters, I think there's enough difference about it that does kind of go by the standard beats of a Western. But it's just trying to be a fun adventure movie that's, I don't think we really get Westerns well, like this I anymore. think, too, it's like, okay, yeah, it, it harkens back to all the good things. But I do feel like it's a very, like, progressive movie. Like, there's a lot of stuff in there that I don't feel like I've really seen too, too much before. And then it takes the Magnificent Seven formula and just only, like, improves on it, really making these characters stronger, really, you know, boosting up the action, putting in that money that you can't always get anymore for a Western, making this a really cool one. So anybody who's bitching about it, it's just that there's something about just, like, almost like the people of nowadays, I think just they're so goddamn like ungrateful for what they have. They don't really realize how much cool shit is fucking around them. So they just have to tear apart everything because they got, in a sense, no worries in life. There's nothing that's threatening them. So they're just going to take out all this, like, I don't know, built up anger or something out on just cool fucking shit just because they can. And it's just the cool hip thing now to do is to be the guy who's like, yeah, I'm very like cynical towards everything. Life is fucking stupid. You know, these movies suck. Why? Because, you know, it's so much Captain America in life. It's just, why do we need that? So much Captain America. You know, you just kind of see people, it's just like, dude, what? It's like, why are you, it's like, why are you complaining about cool fucking shit? Like, to me, I, I look at that Magnificent Seven remake, I'm like, that's like a perfect fucking movie. Like, you couldn't ask for more out of an action flick. It's got tons of great action in it. And even though it's a PG-13 movie, it's like almost like 
borderline R. Maybe it's like nowadays we can get away with like, well, you know, it's Western violence, so it's not nearly as like bad as like real violence in nowadays. It's almost kind of looked upon maybe as being like stage violence or sort of how like sometimes like martial arts violence can kind of get away with being PG-13 more than, you know, regular like crime 2000 serious kind of ness. I know mm-hmm. this is overall, I just think that it's like, I love how they just dive into all these characters. As I was saying before, okay, you got Denzel is pretty much the main one there. And then Chris Pratt's coming in as being the Steve McQueen guy. But they, once again, they add more to him. It's like, he's got a little bit of this magic skill. He's got a little bit more charm. He, you know, he's kind of playing it like he does in Jurassic World or even uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. But that's not a bad thing. That's a cool character to have in there. And then it's like some of the other characters are where they really start diving into. Like probably, I think the guy who almost is like the showstopper of the entire movie is Vincent D'Onofrio's character. And I, the way he plays it, I think is because you just, he plays it completely different than he plays in any other movie he's in. He plays this old kind of overweight tracker guy who's slightly religious, but totally violent. And he talks in a soft voice where it's like, oh yeah, the old guys there, they hit me over the head with a rock. By God, I'm going to fuck their day up. Like almost this. And it's just like, it's so he does. Weird he just talks- like, oh, I didn't expect that voice, but I like that. <laughs> he's like i'm just gonna wear wear their scalps as a pelt you know he just gets he is like he just kind of unhinged that, that oh, yeah definitely. totally and it's just I, I think that's just cool dynamic there and then you know you get ethan hawk and they dive into him being the southerner civil war confederate guy who's having this all this stress of life and war and carrying on and he's got bung lee in there to kind of like be his I don't know, like, it's like kind of like man service. It's almost like they have this weird relationship. Like, you know, we may or may not fuck in the middle of the night. I'm <laughs> just going to say. <laughs> well, I like that. It was kind of like a big, it was a major bromance oh, yeah. between those two. And, and it was like basically like, uh, Bill, his name was Billy Rocks, the B Lung Hong character, uh, the Bung, the Bung Lee character. And he was just like, he was, he was the knife thrower. He was Charles, he was, um, James Corbin. And, when he comes in, it's just he's just a total badass, and they make a couple of, like references, like, oh, he's just you know some like you know Oriental, won't pay him no mind. He just comes in like, really, Bell? All right, yeah. let's fucking do this. No, he's he's totally badass, and even that scene that they got in the old one too, where like James Corbin just kind of mind his own business, and he's kind of having this like friendly duel with this other guy, and then when the whole crowd's like, yeah, you know James Corbin's faster than you, and the guy's like, fuck that shit. He's like, I want to do it for real. I want to do it again. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, you fat piece of shit. And then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, they get serious. They're like, yeah, I'll fucking do it. And they have that. There's that There's that one guy who's like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the original. And then it's like, you know, they go to the duel. And they do it a little bit different. And I guess you could say in the Magnificent Seven one, because Bung Lee takes his hat off. And he's got this pin in there to hold his hair up and whatnot. And they go to do the draw. He doesn't need a gun. Just like James Corbin doesn't need a gun. He just pulls out his fucking switchblade. And, you know, and then as like, he's like, do it. Fucking pull the trigger. He's like, oh, no, we don't want to do it. He's like, no, 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 you do it. You pull that trigger, damn it. I'll show this guy who's the fastest. You know, and as, you know, fires the gun, boom, takes him out right in the heart with a fucking knife. And then in the new one with the hairpin. New one, I don't think he took him out. I want to say like he got him in the hand or something. Well, maybe he did get him in the hand. Maybe I'm just combining both scenes together. And then they're going around making the, uh. Maybe he actually did get him. Maybe I, maybe he did get him in the chest. No, I think he did get him in the heart. I think that's how they, they killed him both times. I, actually, I think you're right, yeah. And they're going around. Like, Ethan Hawke's almost just like his promoter. And he almost kind of gets by because he's this legendary veteran. But by this point, um, the uh, knife thrower is basically his uh, right-hand man. And he's kind of... He's, yeah, his bodyguard yeah. almost, mm, too. Yeah. And he's going around. He's, like, collecting. There's one guy who's like, I don't believe it. That's... I didn't know he was going to use some kind of magic on him. I'm not going to. This was this was fixed. He's just like, you guys lied. And then they say like, you realize how it is. That's that's fucking Ethan Hawke right there. You don't talk about Ethan Hawke. <laughs> you don't talk about Ethan Hawke. This is like, oh, I'm sorry. He's like, it's okay. I'll let you buy. Just pay me double. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, and then he moves on. Yeah, I like that one too. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Let you get by. <laughs> it's one of those things where the cowardly character, his main thing, and I mean, I'm not, this isn't me trying, because I love the original. I'm not sure... I think I still might like the original more, but I really, really do like the new one a lot. And Mm -hmm. the new one um, was something I do like about it, though, because the original, the the uh, veteran character, he is a lot more shaken up. And that's almost his defining quality. He's just putting on a a strong act 
but he's actually really scared. Where in this one, they give him a lot more to do with Ethan Hawke. And Lee Bung Hung, uh, is it Lee Bung Hung? Is that, his, is that how you pronounce his name? Lee Bung Hung? Well, he knows. I his think his character's is. name is Billy Rocks. But he knows that like he's a little shell-shocked and he's a, he has P, uh, PTSD. But he actually kind of looks out for him. Like there's a part where he had, he had an opportunity to take a guy out, but he didn't. And then uh, he took it. And he's just like, oh, it's jammed. He took the rifle from him. It's jammed. That's all it is. Yeah, he's he's covering for him. Pretty it gives much. him this look like because I Chris Pratt's the one who's starting to go like, wait a second, that fucker didn't do anything. Because when they first show up the town, I guess the thing is, in this one instead, you know, they they pretty much the bad guy show the town, and this one's different. Like it's almost like worse because the other one's just more like ah. Hey, you Mexicans, you guys are just going to take care of us, make us dinner, shine our shoes, all this kind of stuff as we carry on. Because, you know, we're not finding food and whatnot. They, they do it like that. But this other one's like, no, we show up. We're going to come back in three fucking weeks and give you 20 bucks for your fucking land, which is about the price of like two rifles back then. You know, and he's like, you can either take it or we can just shoot you right fucking here and get it for free. So it's up to you. 20 bucks or nothing. You make the fucking decision. And, and then like. They were like in a church all like, well, we'll hide in this church. They can't do anything here. It's like, yeah, fucking right. Burn that fucking church down. And then they're on the outside. And this one chick's like husband's like, you know, I'm going to stand up for what's right, which just ends up getting him fucking shot. And then they start shooting a couple other people. Like a lady starts running towards her and they shoot her in the back and somebody gets stabbed. They get her with a hatchet because they have the one Native, oh, yeah, they have the one Native American guy as his right hand man. He just like chucks a fucking axe in their back. Yeah, he's, yeah, exactly. So they really just like fucking brutalize this town more than just like slapping the guy around who's like the mayor of the town in the original one, being like, okay, yeah, you feed us next time we get back, you fucking kidder. <laughs> and, and the other thing is about this the villain in this one's played by Peter Sasgard, where the original was Eli Walk. And he's just this big, you know, he's just an industrialist, you know, his business is mining, his business is land. And he just comes in and says, like, I'm going to take you all. He, he is definitely a snidely whiplash-like character. He's always mm-hmm. kind of hunched over. He's always kind of just sweating. He always looks angry. Like, nothing makes him happy. But he has this, no. like, he has this, seems like he has kind of like an inferiority complex, you know? So he's trying to prove how strong he is by strong-arming everybody around him. And they even, this movie does take a lot of lines, just quick lines from the original, and drops them in here. Like, he says a line, mm-hmm. like, if he didn't want them to be shed, he wouldn't have made him sheep. God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then um, the Chris Pratt character says a good handful of Steve McQueen lines. Like, there's a line like, one time there was this guy that jumped 10 stories down. Last words were, good so far. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so far, so good. Yeah. That's a joke they no, play no, several no. times, yeah. No, that's kind of cool. They do, they do just literally pull some lines and just pop them in there. And they all work well once again. Which is really neat. But in a sense, okay, so after this whole brutalizing the town, then, you know, you get this one chick who's like, I'm going to rise up, and it kind of gives a strong female character, which... And the other one was like, at first, for a while, they're like, there's no fucking females in this town. Like, what are these guys all doing? Like, butt-fucking each other? <laughs> like, to produce children? Well, I, and then all of a sudden, they realize that, like, oh, no, there was a bunch of white people coming, so we hit our women out in the middle of the woods, you know? <laughs> well, there is that thing, I will say, the uh, Chico, which is the young guy of the group, he does seem kind of conflicted with his sexuality. He's like, there's this girl who he's kind of hanging out with and he's just like, Oh, girls gross. But she's kind of also at the same time. She kind of has the thing for him, he's like, but I want to go play with the boys. And then at the very end, I found a bull in the woods and we had a good time <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, cause it's like, Oh, the girl ruined that fun time. I was having with that bull in the woods. It's like, I don't know what it is. He plays it like a 10 year old boy. Almost. <laughs> he does. He does. Like if he gets to his cottage in the village, it's like he has a fort. He has like a, a mattress fort or something. Yeah, exactly. He's out there. He's like playing cowboys and Indians inside it. <laughs> but, he's got a couple action figures in there. A couple of little kids are like, really? I mean, okay. Yeah. Just like says no girls allowed on his door. <laughs> <laughs> clubhouse it's all it's all misspelled and like the letters are all turned sideways <laughs> and backwards and shit <laughs> like, yeah it's <laughs> like um, clubhouse like club spelt with a k no but um, <laughs> there was like at the very end of the movie when he when they uh, when they're all leaving that the the original there's that part where the remainders they're the, the original the three that make it out are in the original are yule brenner steve mcqueen and the young guy and then as they're leaving, they he sees the girl like, adios, 
I'll say that's something I do like about the original is they they say a lot without saying really very much. Yeah, and then that's kind of like almost how old movies always kind of were. You got more in the feel, and then there came a time where they felt like they needed more explaining. Yeah, and then like after that, Chico goes back to the town and stays with the girl, and so he's like, oh, he's not made for the cowboy life, you know, because he's trying to prove himself. And then you get to uh, this one, and they actually they surprised me with who made it out and who died in the new one. And I think that's kind of cool to change it up a bit, because that's what I like about the new one. Is the new one, it's almost like the perfect definition of a remake. I mean, one, it's been over 50 years. So that, to me, is like, okay, that's fine to make a remake. When it's been that long, that's okay. Because no matter what, it's never going to take away from the original one. And plus, it's been so many years that... It's totally okay. It's not like it's 10 years later and they're rebooting fucking Spider-Man or something. Mm-hmm. No, this one's it's been a long enough time. And then two, even though it's uses the same exact formula, which has been used in other movies throughout time too, because that is kind of one of those things like, even if you never saw Magnificent Seven or Seven Samurai, you probably saw some movie that used that type where like, town needs help, they go get some guys, they kick ass. Um, but it is the way that they kind of rotate these characters around and how different things happen and the characters that survive and the characters that don't. I mean, in both of them, the Denzel and Yul Brenner characters both survive, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. I will say Denzel, Denzel, he just, this is, this movie is just a testament of why he's one of my favorite actors. And he just walks in the thing about Denzel. He could be calm as fuck. And he could be like saying like, Hey, I'm Denzel. What's up? And he could also be like, I'm going to kill you. Either way, you're like, I'm all right with this. It's cool. It's fine. Uh, ain't so bad. He seems confident. Yeah. 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 There's even that part where like, it's like, there's a scene where he kills Peter Sasgard. And when he's killing him, it's not one of those scenes that makes it all like great and triumphant or anything like that. It's a scene that's meant to be uncomfortable, but at the same time, it's very inter- it's it's very entertaining to watch because he plays the way he kills. They first off, they add a little bit more to it. He he doesn't because this job doesn't pay him a lot. The only reason he's going after this job is because this guy killed his family years back when he was a kid and left him to hang. And he even has like a like hang him high type rope rope burn around his neck, which you don't see till the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. And as he's strangling Peter Sasgard to death in a church, as he's they're playing like this slow build up music, and it's not all triumphant. It's very much like he's like, It's okay, man, you're going, you're going, it's all right. He's all saying like a prayer for him, like, in the valley of death, we all meet, you know. As he's as this guy's kicking and screaming and just trying to get out of it. He's like, It's okay, it's okay. So it's, it's, it's happening. Don't fight it, don't fight it. In which anybody else, it would be very unsettling, but something about like about uh Denzel playing it, it's just like no, it's okay. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. That's how he that says works. hi. <laughs> no, that is kind of a cool scene. And then all of a sudden you see, like, um, what's his name? The bad guy goes for the gun, pulls it out of his boot and everything like that. And then you hear a gunshot go off. And you're like, oh, fuck. No, it's like maybe maybe Denzel got shot. And then all of a sudden, no, it's the chick comes in because she kind of helps out. That's something we didn't forget, too. And for the while, they're first like, no, 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 you're a woman. You know, you go stand back. Go make us fucking burritos or something like that. <laughs> That's very much the case <laughs> of the first one. Oops. Yeah, exactly. Denzel, yeah, you go make me a burrito now, and uh, I'll be back. No, and instead she's like, no, no, I can hold my own. You know, out of all these guys here, like I'm, I'm the best shot. I've been preparing for this ever since that day that my husband got murdered. You know, I've been training. Mm-hmm. So she is kind of this one. At first, everybody's like, no, 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 you got the magnificent seven here. You, you got the best of the best. You know, don't worry about it. But as time goes on, especially when Ethan Hawke's character kind of leaves, she pretty much ends up taking over for him because, you know, once they kind of realize that, oh, crap, he's got that PTSD and he can't handle it anymore. And he runs off in the middle of the night. And so pretty much because not Chris Pine, but fucking Chris, Pratt. Chris Pratt, all, all the Chris's these days. Um, he's the first one to kind of notice it, that he sees that, you know, Ethan Hawke's having this problem here, you know. He sees them in that first gun battle when they show up to town. That part's kind of cool. They just show up to town. They're like, okay, let's fucking clear out all the fucking police and deputies here that are all corrupt. And they just have this badass gun battle. And at first you're kind of going like, is there no civilians here? Where the fuck everybody out? But they're just like shooting people left and right in the street, you know, gunning them down, you know, fucking Chris Pratt's double gunning it and everything like that. And then you just kind of see Ethan Hawke stand there. You know, he sees the guy and he goes to aim, 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 doesn't pull trigger, doesn't pull trigger. But then somebody covers for him like Mung Hun does or something like that. And then as he keeps going on, he keeps seeing Chris Pratt looking at him going, hmm, he hasn't pulled the trigger once. He hasn't shot anybody. You know, it looks like he needs cover and all those kind of things like that. 
And that's where, you know, they have that scene where he comes up and he looks at the gun and, you know, they go, oh, no, no, it was just jam. That's why he has that problem. And later on, when they're training the troops for the defense of the town, you know, he does that thing. He's like, hey, why don't we get Ethan Hawke over here? He's the best shot there possibly is. And everything like that. He's like, why don't you show these guys how they shoot properly? And he kind of has that thing. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want to. I'm just here to coach them, you know. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, no, no. You go ahead. Slaps the gun in his hand. He's like, he pulls it up. A little bit shaky, a little bit shaky. And then just fires off seven perfect shots right in a row just to kind of, like, hold his ground. So everybody's like, oh, yeah, he is fucking badass. And as that kind of goes on, though, more and more times, we realize that he can't handle it anymore. And then that's when the girl kind of steps in to take his place. Mm-hmm. And he comes back. But he does. And he comes back. He comes back. He comes back. And, you know, we're expecting that. Like, that, that, like, like I said, a lot of people, I've not even heard a lot of people. I've heard, like, a few criticisms of the movie. And a lot of it is that it kind of is a Western by the numbers. But my thing is, we don't see a lot of Westerns that much anymore. And when we do, mm -hmm. they're not an old-fashioned Western like this. And when it gets down to it, kind of like people compare. I hear people comparing superhero movies to Westerns a lot. These were kind of like the superhero movies back in the day because there was a lot of them. They all had like a, you know what I mean? They all kind of had this sense of good, bad, very black and white viewpoint of the whole thing. So mm -hmm. I think that this movie right here, I don't know. It's, it's, I just, even though it's sort of a superhero movie to an extent, it, I think it, 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 you know, it's something we don't really get a whole lot of this day and age. Plus, you don't get the thing about this movie, though is it is like, the action in it is fucking jam-packed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I almost will say, it's hard to find a Western that probably has this much action in it. And that's not a bad thing at all. That's just, that makes the movie even better to have this in it. Because in a sense, it is kind of a simple storyline, but I think that's kind of what makes it work, is it's simple enough to kind of get you going, then you can start filling in the action and filling in the character development and balance it all out in the end, and that's what makes it a really cool film. Because, you know, the thing is, is a lot of times when there was a Western made nowadays, you know, they get two million bucks. OK, go out. And, you know, make your movie. So you get these drama ones that are, you know, they're cool sometimes. Sometimes they're OK, you know, and, you know, they'll have their couple action scenes in there, but they just can't make a big budget one where this movie in itself, what makes it so cool. It's like, no, they're like, no, you fucking go out and do whatever you want. Almost in a sense, like make this a badass fucking flick. And, you know, I think the main reason I've kind of come to the conclusion why Western sort of died out. I think it's the baby boomer generation. I think that's the one that sort of like got burnt down in the Western. And I think the main reason why is because the Western was their parents' movie. Mm -hmm. That was their dad's movie. That was the World War II generation. That's why, you know, from, you know, 20s to like almost like 70s, you're just saturated with a copious amount of Westerns. And then in the 80s, it's like they're there, but they, you could see it kind of dwindling at that time. And they'd have to do something different with it if it w did come out in the 80s, like Young Guns. Yeah, they, 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 you know, not saying they, they, they always have a Western. Every year there's at least two or three or four Westerns. But, you know, it got less and less and less as time kind of went on. And I think that's sort of what it was due to was the fact. And see, Young Guns is like the Generation X almost Western, you can kind of say. That was almost for the next ones coming up. But they still maybe didn't like Westerns nearly as much. And, you know, even nowadays, it's like I realize that even, you know, it's hard to find people that actually like Westerns. It's, it's that genre that has kind of like died out. I'm not saying that people don't enjoy a Western, but it's like the diehard Western fans are so rare. And I think, once again, I think it was, it was just things like, oh, that's my dad's movie. Like, you know, in the fucking 60s, you're like, like I want to go fucking watch a Western, mm -hmm. you know, like the shitty 60s kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just like the shitty 90s kid. You get the shitty 60s kid like, but dad, I, I want to go see that Cream concert. It's like, <sighs> There's a John Wayne movie going on. <laughs> Dad, why can't you keep some fucking Coca-Cola in the fridge? I fucking hate this family. <laughs> That's the 90s version. <laughs> like that shitty 60s kid. <laughs> I'm going out to the park to express my feelings of friends. <sighs> no one could see the eyes rolling back that you're doing, like you're being possessed for a minute. Exactly, just like, you know, the World War II dad. Because that's it, because a lot of, I mean, I meet a lot of, like, baby boomer, uh, baby boomer generation people, and a lot of those guys, they're like, I don't really like Westerns very much. It's just one of those ones, it's not really one of their favorite genres. It's not saying that they hate it, but it's, a lot of those guys, they like sci-fi a lot, but they really don't like Westerns. That's And I, I'm, I'm attributing it to, I think it's because it's like, their parents probably watch it all the time, and they just kind of got burnt out on it you know so much because i'd be like what their dad would always probably want to watch that they said you know what 
I got something else. I got sci-fi, Dad. Sci-fi is all the rage, man. I saw this 2001 Space Odyssey, fucking monkeys for 45 minutes in the beginning. Then as he turns, he turns to the wife, Ethel, I think he's gay. I, I think he's gay, and I think he wants to fuck a monkey. <laughs> I knew it. I fucking knew it. Remember that time we went there and he was four years old to the zoo? He liked that mm. monkey cage a lot. Now I know why. Yeah. I saw him. When he, when he kept pointing at the baboon's fucking ass, I knew he was fucking gay. <laughs> you hug him too much, Ethel. You hug him too much. We always learned that Charles Bronson says you gotta beat their fucking asses every time they say something stupid. I love you, Dad. I love you. T- Wait, I can't say it, though. I'll show you love. <laughs> yeah. Boom! I'll punch the love in you. World War II, Dad. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, I know, just to clarify, I know not everybody's grandparents were children beaters. We're not trying to make light of it, but look, well, you gotta admit, it was, was kind of funny. It was, it was a different time, so we can laugh at it now, because yeah. they're pretty much all gone by this point, so. <laughs> but, um, I actually, truth be told, my dad really liked westerns, and, um, it, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, a lot of the stuff I like is stuff that my dad tried to get me into, but I kind of discovered it because, you know, it's one of those things you try and show your kids something and they kind of stay away from it. But later down the line, you know, you try to get me into classic rock, but I wasn't really into it that much. Later down the line, I got into it, but more different bands, bands like Bruce Springsteen and Rolling Stones rather than like Yes or Ambrosia, something like that. And mm-hmm. for the same thing with kind of Westerns, Westerns is one of those things he really tried to get me into Westerns and I just never really cared to watch him but then later in the line i just you know started watching tarantino and knew he took a lot of inspiration from like sergio Leone and other things so i just started watching those and one day he watched walked in on me watching butch cassie and sundance kid he's like wait what you, you, you like westerns it was just kind of like there is hope you know and then magnificent seven he was kind of excited for this movie that see that's cool because you know my dad actually he's not the biggest person into westerns that's like there's two genres he doesn't care for too much and it's westerns and martial arts like, I don't know what it is. Like, it's like he, he likes anything sci-fi. He's the guy he'll watch the most the most corniest sci-fi movie. If he, if he sees a sci-fi movie have one star on Netflix, my dad's the guy who'll be watching it, <laughs> and we'll find all the good about it. Even if it's not that great of a movie, he'll he'll find something he really likes in it. But he's really not uh, that much into westerns or anything kind of old timey. Like he doesn't like Knights of the Round stuff. I'm not he doesn't big, I'm like, not big in middle medieval stuff so much. Yeah, like for something, but he likes everything kind of future and sci-fi and things like that. So I think maybe that's also kind of why. And I'm not saying like, you know, if you watch something like The Magnificent Seven, you could show it to him. He'd probably enjoy, you'd still really enjoy it, not saying anything about it. But he would prefer to see Prometheus 2 over, you know, anything else, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Actually, um, when it comes to Westerns, I'm actually not a big John Wayne guy. Not that I dislike John Wayne, I just never got into John Wayne. Most of my Westerns are like 60s and 70s. yeah. That's definitely true there. And, you know, sadly enough, it's like I actually haven't watched that many John Wayne movies. I always feel bad. I always say I'm going to sit down and just go through a bunch of them because I know he's got a ton of really good stuff. And I have, you know, a handful on DVD and VHS, some that I haven't watched yet. Because I think if you do get deep into it, you'll find some really good John Wayne stuff. Because the thing is, there is a lot of really cool 30s, 40s and 50s Westerns. I know a lot of times people think that's mostly only like late 60s and up. But no, they did make some badass stuff. Like, I really like a lot of Errol Flynn westerns. There's also a bunch of ones, too, like Jimmy Stewart westerns that are fucking badass flicks. And I think they just get kind of forgotten because there's almost like that mindset that, like, post, you know, Clint Eastwood, it's kind of that like, oh, well, those back then, those were all the, you know, just the fun time westerns where, you know, things didn't really have too much consequences and it wasn't gritty and bloody and violent yet. And it's like, no, dude, there's some fucking shit going on. There's like the one, it's called Broken Arrow, and it's not to be confused with that John Travolta one that came out like in the 90s. <laughs> but it has Jimmy Stewart in it, and it's almost kind of like um, like a Jeremiah Johnson where he you know, he marries this like Indian girl and everything like that, and then a bunch of like white guys kind of come in and fucking like murder his whole family and everything like that. And then Jimmy Stewart goes out and gets fucking revenge like nobody's business, and it's badass. I've checked that one out. I've heard yeah. of that one. I haven't seen yeah, it, though. Check, I mean, and that's one of the ones, like, I think that's probably, like, maybe an early 60s or something like that. Something like that. I can't remember exactly. It might be late 50s, early 60s. And it's just like, oh, dude, they make some sweet-ass Westerns. But I think they've just gotten sort of forgotten. I, I will say that I remember this was sort of the the remake was sort of kind of like a byproduct to a certain extent of um, True Grit. Because remember once True Grit came out, a bunch of studios, because that movie surprised a lot of people by how good it did. And it got a lot of critical praise. 
So a lot of people are like, oh, well, more more Western remakes. And Magnificent Seven was one that was on the table for a while. And they're talking about uh, um, Tom Cruise being the Yule Brenner character. And then I just kind of it just kind of faded off. I didn't hear anything about the movie for a while. The one day I go on IMDb, I'm like, Magnificent Seven sh- teaser, what? And I click on, I'm like, that's fucking Denzel. And then I'm just seeing Chris, I'm seeing all these people. I'm just getting amped for the movie. And um, I'm kind of wondering for a minute, they're talking about possibly doing a Wild Bunch remake with Will Smith, which a lot of people were immediately like, no, no. We let it's... we let Will Smith be in a remake of a Western before. Well, that the thing is that it would be an entirely different, even though it's be by the same studio. It would be an entirely even kind of a western because would it be a I think that western. <laughs> I don't think you do the wild wild bunch. Mm-hmm. I don't think you're doing that. Wild, no, wild, uh, bunch. <laughs> wild wild bunch. <laughs> wiki, wiki, wiki. <laughs> it's like oh, it's actually a <laughs> wild, wild west. <laughs> he just like takes the exact same song, just may just calls the bunch instead of the West. Yeah, <laughs> it's like that. It's no, like but he dubbed in too. Like it's almost like he was really lazy. He's like, okay, I got ten minutes. Well, that thing about that one, that's almost kind of like uh, what the Wild Bunch. That is one of the darker, grittier ones. But that's like Westerns gone. This is a, that's almost kind of Magnificent Seven gone bad. And I love that movie. Now I won't stay too long on that movie because we could almost do a whole podcast on that by itself. But something about that, what I think if they did do that, what would make Will Smith work out good in that movie, if, if he did do it, uh, is... There already are a bunch of outlaws that are behind the times. Their backs are to the wall. What better way to get that across than being a black dude in the early 1900s in the Wild West? What better way to get that and be an outlaw on top of that? What better way to get that across, you know? No. Because with with William Holden, William Holden already had it. William Holden was old. He was beaten. But if you add in that other quality that makes it that much more of a difficult like thing to get by where this movie it plays a little bit with that i mean they don't at any point drop any racial slurs but they get across just a little bit that there is a what's he doing here this feller just rolls into town they don't ever say it but you know they he rolls into town and they everyone already is kind of like fuck this guy he's like yeah guess what i'm working for the fucking law so on your fucking on your fucking knees. Well, I like the two when they've come to the main town. It's like the two people they choose to walk in first to town is fucking Denzel on a horse and Bung or Lee Bung Hun, like, and it's just so it's just an Asian guy and a black guy strolling in the town to really piss people off. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I don't think that was coincidental. That was totally, and they even made a thing like they don't serve his top here. It's like oh well, and they they get the knives out. So it is one of those things where I think that they the movie. I mean because. Not every Western, even though if they did make this movie rated R, I'd be totally fine with that. But you'll never really hear me say this too much. I think it's kind of cool they made a Western you could take your younger your, your kid to, you know? Well, and that's the thing I like about it is it's one of those movies, I don't think that it really like pulls it back because it's not rated R because the violence is still like over, the, they're still intense. I mean, okay, the blood's a little bit less. I mean, if it was rated R, you probably would get a lot more like Django-like violence. I think that's probably what's missing. And then obviously, I think they kind of, they almost tone back to racism, which I don't, you know, it's fine because, you know, that's not really what the movie's totally about. Like, yeah, I guess you don't have We see that like a million other Westerns by this Yeah, because now I think after Django, that kind of set that one. It's like, there you go. You hit the pinnacle of like kind of making it that. And, you know, I mean, obviously you can have the light, things like that, but we understand. Like now it's like, okay, get it. You know, black guy being a cowboy. I, I like that kind of genre, though. I think that's cool to see like other people fill in the shoes of being these cowboys and just kind of having to deal with that because it's like a double struggle. So it makes their life just that much more intense. You know, and once again, it's in there enough in The Magnificent Seven, but not so much that that's almost like the main thing of the movie. It's not like you got to focus on that, almost like how Django does, even though I love Django. Well, fun thing about that, because about black cowboys, a lot, something a lot of people don't know, Lone Rider was based on a black dude. Huh. Go figure. So yeah, or Lone Ranger. Yeah, Lone Ranger. Yeah. Lone Rider, <laughs> the off-brand version. Because yeah. your parents could have <laughs> afforded re- like the Lone Ranger action figures, so they got you the Lone Rider. <laughs> it's just the bootleg one, just a different paint job. Yeah, no, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Lone the Lone Ranger was uh, based on a black cowboy. Yeah, so- and and uh, Denzel even took some of that guy's look, the mutton chops and the stash kind of. You know, I tried to go for those mutton chops and the stash. I was like, after I saw him, I'm like, dude, that's fucking badass, Denzel. So I cut that, and I was like, okay, I was looking at myself, and I was like, 
No, I got to get rid of the mustache part. It's just, it is not the same as Denzel. I'm going to look like that guy. It's like, hey, I, I heard you're leaving your kids home, you know, later today by themselves undetended, you know. Just, just thought I'd mention that, you know, just make, get some confirmation. So I was like, okay, now I'll, yes, I'll go, I'll no, go with the, the, the um, fucking, what's his name from 3,000 Miles to Graceland. Oh, the uh, Kiefer Southern. Yeah, Kiefer, not Kiefer, uh, um, close. J- J- Kevin, Kevin, Kevin Costner. I'll, I'll do the Kevin Costner one. I'll just I'll get rid of the mustache part and just keep the sideburns and try that one out. Something nobody said since 1997. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Probably still didn't. Say. What are you doing? Oh, I got the Costner going. <laughs> I got the Costner from 3,000 Miles going. You know, it's kind of cool, kind of like Elvis Presley like. But um, no, yeah, that that mustache and everything like that looks badass on Denzel. Just I think you, you need you need like the right chin to pull off a mustache. I think that's the only possible way. If you don't have a strong enough chin, it just then you got to go like Errol Flynn, like Robin Hood with like a little goatee as well. Since this was an Anton Anton Fuqua movie, at any point were you expecting like you know Denzel to walk up to Ethan Hawke and put a gun to his head like you're gonna smoke this or we're gonna have a fucking problem? <laughs> no, I didn't think about that, but that is kind of true because those guys are a lot of times in the similar movies. And he even had that. There even is a little bit dynamic. Like we worked together before. It's like, oh hey, you're back. Like yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Don't you fucking forget it. Well, really quickly, actually speaking of like before we go too far away from it, if they did do a Wild Bunch remake, see, once again, I think that's fine too because that's been long enough. Because what's Wild Bunch? 71 or two? It's like pretty much about 10 years past Magnificent Seven. Mm -hmm. That's still long enough away that that's okay. You know what I mean? One that would be kind of weird is if they said, oh, we're doing a Young Guns remake. That yeah. would make me feel like, okay, that's a little bit close, you know? I'm not saying that you couldn't do it, but that that wasn't that long ago. That was still only 26 years ago, which that sounds like... I guess that sounds like a long time when you say it out loud, but... I think I think Westerns are something you can get away with remaking. I think that is something, just because... I mean, you know, this because this movie is one of those things... It It is fairly similar, but even, like, the way the plot goes, it's, you know, I think there's enough... Di- I think there's enough of a difference there. It's, it's obvious. If they didn't call this Magnificent Seven, you'd be going, like... They totally ripped off Magnificent Seven. But at that same time, though, I don't think you'd be mad because, you know, so many other... It would be like, oh, it's kind of homaging that or whatever. But exactly at the same time, this this movie, though, there's enough difference there because what essentially happens in the original Magnificent Seven, they we focus in on the Mexican guys. They get to town. They see Yul Brynner and, um, and uh, Steve McQueen do a decent act. They ask them. They build a team. They come back. They get, I think, a small little shootout from a spy, and then from there, it's just a lot of planning. And then uh, Eli Wallach comes in, and there is this back and forth of them setting and arranging, preparing for this attack, and then them coming back and forth like in different waves Mm -hmm. until they come back for the final battle. So it's kind of like the Alamo, sort of, to an extent. Not one big long battle, but it's almost kind of like they're always staying in the same place. Where this movie, the remake, you know, they go out, they build the team, they come back, they clear out the town of all the crooked cops, and then the rest of the movie, they're in the same spot, fortica- uh, you know, building up the town, fortifying it, putting dynamite everywhere. Then you get this big brawl at the end. And... It works. What I like about this one, too, is they just up the ante on the action. Like, that final ba- battle, it's like it's almost like, mm-hmm. maybe it's not a half an hour long, but it sure feels like it. And they just, you know, not like, yeah, they set up the dynamite, so they set up all these traps. They got the guys hiding in all these trenches, you know, all the, the farmers and everything like that. They got the town secured, and then this humongous army. Because in the other one, I don't know, the, the battle's still really cool, but it's, you know, maybe a battle of, like, 35 40 guys if that you know i mean there's not nearly as much this one it's like they're taking on a full-on like 100 man army almost just tons of action going on and to the point where like okay we finally we blew up a bunch of the guys we shot a copious mounts and it's like bring out the heavy guns and they bring out the fucking minigun and just start raping the town with this thing just like destroying it left and right so they you know it's just almost like this power here and then, you know, as they're battling through, you know, people start getting fucking shot up. You know, it starts getting to that point where it's like, oh, God, we're losing guys. And even to the point where um, Chris Pratt, he gets kind of wounded and stuff. And he's kind of, you know, there and, you know, people keep going ask him like, oh, you OK, you OK, I'm fine, I'm fine. But he finally sends out this like cavalry. So far, so good. Yeah, he sends out this cavalry of himself and he just there. starts running at them, you know, just full on, just firing one gun on a horse just towards this minigun. 
taking guys out. And then still he gets shot a couple times, gets knocked off his horse. He's laying there on the ground and he's pretty darn close by this point. And he keeps coming up. They shoot him a couple more times. He gets closer, falls down, like almost like a fucking Terminator coming in. And then goes to light the cigarette. And at first this guy's like, oh, he's just going to shoot him around the head. He's like, no, no. Give, give, give him one last honorable part. Lights a cigarette for him and everything like that. And he sits there and then kind of like keels over. And they're like, oh, he's fucking dead. And then when they all kind of stop paying attention, he turns up and he's got a stick of dynamite lit just right next to them all and just blows up. It's just There's some badass stuff going on in that movie. Like, I can't wait just to see it again just to get even more feel for all these different cool scenes. Yeah, it's a, it's a totally awesome movie. And I think that people that... I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. The original one, people say there's a lot of things going on deep within the characters. I'm like, I, I mean, there are little things that this one has that the other one didn't have and vice versa. I don't think the other one was that deep. I think they actually kind of threw out, flat out said what was going on. I mean, there are some things they have, like I said earlier, it says a lot with saying very little. And I think that's the most kind of a way how a lot of like 60s writing worked. And plus, especially just given like the gravitas that Yul Brynner and Steve McQueen have when they speak. Mm -hmm. But this movie, it's just kind of like the the first one was a fun action adventure movie. This one's a fun action adventure movie. So I think when people complain about, oh, it's not the same. Like, of course, it's not the same. It's fucking years later. Well, it's not the same, but it's not that far off either. Like, I mean, yeah. I can't if you like the original Magnificent Seven, I can't see how you wouldn't love this one. And it's almost to the point where it's not like exactly the same. I mean, yeah, it's the same like basic story, but I feel it's different enough. That you, it's not like one movie replaces the other because there are certain things where like you know a remake almost can kind of replace another one. Because and I, I mean, not saying you couldn't go back and watch it, but here's here's an example. You know, you take the thing and then the original thing, and mm -hmm. the original thing's a cool movie to watch and it's got some cool neat scenes in it. But boy, once you get that John Carpenter thing, it's like oh man, that fucking really defines that movie. This one right here, I don't feel like either one of them like totally like makes the other like unnecessary. I actually, I think they're both really fun movies. I think I like the original one still a little more, mm -hmm. but this is still a really fun movie. Yeah, and I think actually myself, I'll probably say I actually think I like the remake just a little bit more because I think, and you know, I mean, obviously it's you know fifty years later they have all this time to kind of like work this in, but I just think they get the characters just a little bit more dialed in. You know, obviously the action is going to be just a little bit more over the top which that's all totally fine that's cool and just almost making the villain seem even more evil than he was i think all around it's just it makes for like pff, one of the best remakes i probably have seen in a long time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was it was definitely i'm definitely gonna get this movie when it comes out on oh yeah this is like a must buy i'd love to go see it in theaters again almost even too i don't know i might may who knows i was like the only one i, I sent like a text to like a bunch of my friends in the area want to go see magnificent seven just like nah, we're okay like wh what oh, see that's no. the thing you, you realize that a lot of people don't like western that's kind of you kind of forget yeah. that that there's a lot of people out there it's like oh they oh you, you don't really like clint eastwood movies They're like well i know who clint eastwood is he's like that guy who makes crazy sounds nowadays and it's like what, what the fuck are you talking about he's like yeah he just speaks his mind like in public like, no, no, fuck, movies, movies, you see? He's got the Clint Eastwood in his shooting the gun. Oh, that's what he did? Oh, oh okay. I thought he was just a crazy old man that people just brought along for entertainment. <laughs> you know, and, it's, share, Mr. and it is that thing. It's just like, I kind of forget that it's like, me and you love Westerns a lot. We really enjoy Clint Eastwood and a lot of these other things. But you talk to other people and nobody's seen it. I remember I was like, when I was watching movies, like, oh, dude, did you totally watch the Magnificent like uh, Seven original one beforehand? He's like, I don't think I've ever seen this. Oh, huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought everybody saw that. I mean, like, I thought that was like, you know, or like being American, you know? <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. Cause a lot of people talk about that movie like it is a timeless classic, which I'm not denying that. But when it came out, a lot of people disliked it. In America, so, they didn't like it very much, strangely enough. It was in Europe this what saved that movie from going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. and, and then you, you know, now years later, people talk about, how could they, how can they like remake this movie? Just like they fuck you talking about it <laughs> you know <laughs> like what are you talking now i mean i know it's not the exact same people it's not like they're all like you're not all like all critics are like some symbiotic like it's not like they're symbiotes from like fucking spider-man they all like share the same knowledge and all speak the same thing but like and when they pass away like they absorb into another body. yeah it's not like that but it's one of those things where it's like people talk about like how loved the movie is like now it is but back when it came out i mean i'm not sure if this movie will have that because It'll be known as a remake, but regardless, I think it's still a really fun movie. And regardless of like other negative criticism I heard, everybody's talking about how good the actors are in this movie, especially, you know, 
Denzel Washington, who always fucking brings it. Chris Pratt, who's kind of, I'm noticing Chris Pratt in a different way. Because Steve McQueen, he's kind of like, Steve McQueen is very like, I'm the charming, good looking dude. I've got to say a whole lot to get the crowd to love me. But he kind of just plays himself. Chris Pratt mm-hmm. is kind of playing, you know, doing the Jurassic World, uh, Star Lord kind of thing in this movie. And yeah. just, you know, he comes across as a little sloppier, but he also comes across as just kind of like charming at the same time. No, that's totally true. And that, it's like, that's what I like about it. Even if he plays kind of the similar characters in a lot of movies, that's okay, because that's what I want to see, is I want to see that Chris Pratt character. I did notice that Chris Pratt's fucking big. I There's a scene where him and Denzel are riding together, and Denzel's in the foreground, Chris Pratt in the background, and they're right next to each other. He is fucking big. And it's just one of those things like you see that I don't mean like, I mean, he is, I know he, I know he's, he worked out a lot to get buff for this part in like guardians. But beyond that though, he, he, I know he was kind of like a portly guy. So I see him. I'm just kind of like, show me how. <laughs> I know. Well, cause you watch old Chris Pratt movies and it's just like, Oh my God, he was like, he wasn't just like slightly overweight. I mean, he was like, he was like a Jonah Hill character almost. It was just like, Oh, Oh, and then now it's like, oh wow! It's like he 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 had a big. You, you can go from being Jonah Hill to Brad Pitt, like, and all in just a little bit of time now, kids. Yeah, and even like jo- Jonah Hill, it's kind of an up and down thing depending on the role he has. But you know, and he's one of those actors I'll see probably whatever he's in. But um, oh yeah, I don't really like. I like Jonah Hill for who he is. It's not like I'm, I'm not saying that in a bad way, but I'm just pointing out another fat actor. Mm-hmm. Or, or it's like I guess it's almost like you could say it's like a Kevin James, and then he turns next, into like, right? next episode top five favorite fat actors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That'll be our next retrospect. <laughs> now, to curious, I wanted to ask you: Have you ever seen any of like the Magnificent Seven sequels? No, I haven't. Um, I'm curious. Lee Van Cleef is in one of them. There was a 1998 short-lived Magnificent Seven made-for-TV series. Um, mm-hmm. I uh, have not seen any of the sequels. I'm kind of curious. It's like if they did, I'm, I'm going to say this: If they did make a sequel for this, that would be cool. But at the same time. It would be it'll feel really weird because I was so sure the two people would probably come out of this was Denzel Washington, Brad Pitt, the other I wasn't sure who <laughs> you was Chris be. Pratt. <laughs> I mean, I, who I say, I say Brad I, Pitt I, just kind of comes out the very like, oh, when I he was there the whole time. When I, uh, here's what happened: it's gonna be a weird how how'd you get to that? Um, he just found his way back in the movie. When I think Steve like Brad Pitt seems like the Steve McQueen of this his generation to me. Uh huh. Totally. And. I think that Brad Pitt, I mean, I think uh, Brad Pitt and Chris Pratt are very different actors, but at the same time, I thought he, I think he, he, I kind of see the similarities between Steve McQueen's character or Steve McQueen's style of acting and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, shit, Chris Pratt's style of acting. So even though I will say that, you know, okay, Brad Pitt definitely feels like the Steve McQueen character of the time, but you know who really looks like Steve McQueen though is Daniel Craig. (laughs) That's a good point. Yeah, that's a very good point. When you look at Daniel Craig, it's like, yeah, you know, they got like similar head shapes and everything. That sounds weird to say like really that. Really thin but... hair. Yeah. Yeah. And you I, know that... I think because Steve McQueen always plays himself well, uh, where, well, uh, uh, Daniel. Pratt, I mean, Chris getting mixed up. <laughs> I don't know which one's which anymore. Uh, Chris Pratt kind of plays himself. And I think that's yeah. what's kind of charming about this, about both versions of the character in these two movies. So for whatever reason, I landed on Brad Pitt when I meant to say Chris Pratt. But I was just, I was pretty sure uh, Denzel and Chris Pratt were going to make it out. And then the third, if there was going to be a third, I wasn't sure who. So I was surprised when Chris Pratt goes. And the two characters that kind of stay was like, there was the, actually there's the one guy, I guess you say this dude's kind of their wild card. There's the Mexican outlaw guy, which mm-hmm. he survives. And that's the one guy that didn't seem as like flushed out as other characters, but he was still fine. He was because we didn't talk about him at all yet so far. I thought about that about halfway through the podcast. I'm like, oh, we haven't mentioned that guy yet, and then I forgot, and then then <laughs> kept going. Then there was the Native American guy who was just total badass. Uh, he was his 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 thing was it wasn't that he was a super well developed character. He's like he's just a fucking killing machine. That's all we need him to be. Yeah, he's our archer sniper guy who pretty much comes in and he's just like you want to. It's like we're just Denzel walks like you want to kill some white people. <laughs> That's, that'd be fine like, I, I, don't, I don't blame him like yeah fuck yeah dude you know fuck yeah god damn right yeah it's like he starts going towards the guy no 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 not them not, not them. them other white people like, mm. oh, oh. he's just like that's why he kind of like doesn't have dinner with them he's always off in another building from a distance like yeah. soon <laughs> but no yeah it's kind of weird because yeah because yeah it's the mexican guy um denzel and uh who's the other person that survives 
It's it's uh, the Mexican dude and the Apache, and Denzel. Oh yeah, the, the Apache does survive. See, and I if they did do a sequel, not saying they have to, that would be kind of a cool one to see where they go with those three characters, and then maybe if they have to find you know a, a new team or something, you know that that wouldn't be a bad thing. I don't think. I mean, I don't think it's is it necessary? No, but if they did do it, I think that still sounds cool, anyways. Yeah, I mean, because I think that the big dynamic of the movie, one of the big dynamics was probably the relationship between Denzel and uh, and Chris Pratt. Yes. And then another one was dynamic between Ethan Hawke and Denzel. And then Ethan Hawke and uh, Bung Lung Hee. Uh, yeah. Bung, Bung Lee, Bung Lee. Um, so, I, but, you know, I'm sure if they did make, if they made a sequel, like, like chances are if you make a major Western I will more than likely see that in theaters because there's we get so few of them. I, I, I pretty much feel like it's like our like duty to go see them. Like I don't care what it is if it's in theaters. I like to go see it just to support what might not be there in the future. Yeah, well, I noticed we made a joke because our friend Cisco he loves musicals and we don't give a shit about musicals. So if there's a musical, he usually goes sees it and we're like, oh, if he sees a fucking music, he's gonna see because he likes fucking musicals. Oh, whatever. Just, and then that now, but we can't really talk shit out because we do the same thing with westerns. <laughs> yeah, we, we do the same thing. It's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta go see it. it's my civic duty. It's like voting. It's important. <laughs> it's the American thing to do, goddammit. I don't want really either Triller, Tr- Hillary or Trump to win, but fuck it, here we go. But I, I gotta go see a western, though. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it'd be kind of cool. But yeah, I've never seen any of those other Magnificent Seven because like there's the Yul Brenners and the second one, like the Magnificent Seven Rides Again. And I kind of looked on because there's four of them in a sense out of the original movies. And I think that's the one that's got Lee Van Cleef in it. And I think when I was I was reading some of the reviews on Amazon just in the pack because I'm like, oh, I didn't realize there was I knew there was a sequel. I just didn't realize there was like two other ones following it. And I was looking at that pack and I was all, well, Let's read some reviews here, just just to get an idea. And one guy talks, he's like, okay, the second one's not bad. It's still pretty good. But he's like, that third one is actually a really fucking awesome movie. It doesn't really tie into the other ones. But as far as a Western goes, it's full on amazing. And then he's like, the fourth one's kind of like a B Western. Just okay. Is that Guns of the Magnificent Seven? I can't remember exactly which one. I know it's like Magnificent Seven Rides Again, I think, is the second one. And then the Guns might be the fourth one. I'm not too sure. But he said the third one was the best of the sequels. And actually, it was almost as good as the Magnificent Seven. But just in kind of a completely different way. Huh. Well, I'll have to check so that not, out eventually. So yeah, someday when you want to fill that Western void, there's more things to watch. But no. Overall, just that Magnificent 7 remake, I know he said this multiple times, just a pure amazing fucking remake. Definitely you should see it. Even if you don't like Westerns, but as long as you like action movies, I can't see how you couldn't like it. That's what makes this one kind of a nice one. It's not so Western that it might scare people away, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's got enough charm, enough comedy, and enough other stuff going on that I think it can attract a more broader audience. But, yeah, go see that. And then make sure if you've never seen the original one, check that one out too, because that movie does, is not aged at all. It's, I mean, still holds up really well, which most Westerns do. It's very rarely do you find a Western that ages. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, because I think it's something about, like, having a movie set in the past. I don't know, it just makes it age a little better. Just Or, like... Doesn't age. It's like, well, it's an old movie, so it makes sense to be old, right? Yeah, it's always going to look old. It's you know, mostly the only things that age is mostly sci-fi movies. That's probably the movies that have the hardest time. Because you got something usually in the future, but it's made a long time ago. So yeah, yeah. Not saying that that still can't be kind of fun, but mm-hmm. yeah, that's the lines the genre suffers. But that's probably a good place to wrap it all up. You got anything else you want to say on Magnificent Seven? Uh, both movies are awesome. Check them both out. But yeah. So that was our fun little alternative Western segment. Uh, Let us know what you thought about that. We'll probably end it there and continue on to finding something new to talk about on our retrospect coming up. But yeah, till then, you know, you can find me at Spencer S. Holmes on Twitter. You can find Dunnigan at Dunnigan Ryan on Twitter. Until then, check out OldManOrange.com for more podcasts, cartoons, music, and more. Anything else? No, I'm good to go. Okay. Well, I'm Spencer Scott Holmes. I'm Ryan Dunnigan. We'll see you some other time. Thanks for listening to the Old Man Orange Podcast. Check out our website at oldmanorange.com for even more podcasts, cartoons, videos, music, and more. Send us an email at oldmanorangepodcast at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review us on iTunes, Podomatic, or any of the other fine sites we might be located on. And if you want to help out even more, click on the Amazon or GameStop links on our webpage before you make any purchases there. Won't cost you a penny, but it sends us a little something our way. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week to Old Man Orange.